Leg Calve Perthes, a presentation by Shannon Cobb and Megan Stanley. Leg Calve Perthes disease is a form of osteonecrosis of the hip that is found only in children. Little is known about the disease, however, it is known that bone death occurs in the head of the femur due to an interruption of blood flow. This is a process called avascular necrosis. As bone death occurs, the head of the femur develops a fracture of the supporting bone. This fracture signals the beginning of bone reabsorption by the body. As bone is slowly absorbed, it is replaced by new bone and tissue. The femoral head is less strong after the bone dies and can become flattened due to weight and pressure placed on the bone during normal physical activity. Over a one to two year period, the damaged bone in the femoral head is slowly removed and replaced with new bone. Perthes disease is not very common. It is estimated that Perthes disease affects about 5 to 10 per 100,000 children under the age of 15. Because this condition is not common, not many physicians and healthcare providers see this condition and may be unfamiliar with the details of the disease. Perthes disease is 4 to 5 times more common in boys than girls. While children between the ages of 2 and 15 may get the disease, it is most commonly affecting children between the ages of 4 to 8. The disease is found most often in Asians, Eskimos, and Caucasians, with a much lower incidence found in Australian Aboriginals, Native Americans, Polynesians, and African Americans. The cause of Perthes disease is currently unknown. Perthes disease is not considered to be inherited since less than 5% of the children who have the disease have a family history. There are hip conditions that are inherited that can mimic Perthes disease, like multiple epiphyseal dysplasia and other skeletal dysplasias. There is no specific cause known for Perthes disease, however, there are some risk factors. Some risk factors identified as possible links include children who are small for their age and extremely active. If male, they may have some minor genitourinal abnormalities like inguinal hernia and undescended testes. Perthes disease is a disease of exclusion because it can mimic other conditions. Similar conditions must be ruled out by taking a careful medical history and doing a thorough physical examination. To rule out other conditions, physicians generally ask about family history of hip disorders, family history of early joint replacement, previous hip surgery, past use of steroid medication for asthma, or other medical conditions such as history of sickle cell disease, history of hip infection, clotting disorders, and endocrine disorders. In addition, x-rays of the hip are required to make the diagnosis of Perthes disease. In a small number of patients who come to the clinic shortly after the onset of symptoms, the x-rays may be normal if not enough time has passed for the x-ray changes to occur. If a patient is still suspected of having Perthes disease, a perfusion MRI will be used to make the diagnosis because it is more sensitive than a conventional MRI and better at ruling out. These images show an example of a perfusion MRI for a child with Perthes disease. In the top image, the affected femoral head on the left side of the image appears dark, where you see the circle, in the areas of no blood flow. In the bottom image, the brighter white areas around the femoral head, where you see the arrows, indicate inflammation of the hip joint. The opposite hip joint appears normal with blood flow to the bone and no inflammation. The first symptom notice is often limping and lateral lean while walking. This is usually painless. The limp may get worse after activities and get better with rest. Sometimes there may be mild pain that comes and goes. Other symptoms may include hip stiffness that limits hip movement, pain that is referred to the knee, limited range of motion, thigh or groin pain that does not go away, shortening of the leg or legs of unequal length, and muscle loss in the upper thigh. Leg calve perthes can be classified into four stages. The first stage is called the initial stage or the stage of avascular necrosis. This is the stage when the bone cells die due to the disruption of blood flow and it can last for several months. The child's symptoms may get better and then get worse. The next stage is the fragmentation stage, when the head of the femur breaks down and fragmentation and resorption occur. The dead bone is being removed by osteoclasts, but it is not immediately replaced by new bone, but by fibrous scar tissue which is not as strong as normal bone. As a result, the bone is weakened and is susceptible to flattening or collapse with daily normal activity. The degree of symptoms may vary from child to child, but pain and limp become more obvious and there is more loss of motion. In the third stage, new bone grows in the head of the femur via osteoblastic activity as dead bone is also removed. 
The pain and limp symptoms usually start to improve during this stage, and while some decreased range of motion is still present, the child will gradually be able to return to activity. In the fourth stage, healing occurs as the bone is reshaped. The shape of the head of the femur may continue to change until growth stops. This residual phase is marked by completion of bone rebuilding. This x-ray shows the first three stages of LCP. In the first stage, you can see the affected femoral head appears wider and slightly smaller than the unaffected side. The distance between the femoral head and the inside of the socket may be increased. The femoral head becomes more dense with a possible fracture of supporting bone. In the second stage, the femoral head starts to fragment and areas of bone resorption are seen as darker spots on the x-ray. The femoral head can appear slightly out of the socket. In the third healing stage, white areas of newly formed bone appear on the femoral head, gradually filling in towards the center of the head. During your subjective patient history, you will often find a child who is very physically active, complaining of night pain, with no history of a specific traumatic event. Upon observation, a psoatic limp can be seen due to weakness of the psoas major. This limp will appear worse following activity and be eased with rest. You may or may not observe a Trendelenburg gait and or a Duchenne gait, which is portrayed as a lateral trunk lean towards the stance leg. You may also note a leg length discrepancy and atrophy of the glutes, quads, hamstrings, and muscles in the upper thigh. Patients report constant pain that is increased with activity and localized to the groin, anterior hip, and greater trochanter regions. Pain may or may not be referred down to the knee. A decrease in hip range of motion at extremes can be observed with marked decrease in abduction and internal rotation. Severe cases may portray an adduction contracture. You will find decreased strength aligning with the atrophy observation in the quads, hamstrings, and glutes, and x-rays and MRIs are the most common imaging techniques used in evaluation and monitoring of LCP. Treatment of LCP patients can be broken down into three phases. All phases may be treated with pain modalities, range of motion and strengthening exercises, gait training, and balance exercises. More specifically, the severe involvement phase patients will benefit from heat or cryotherapy, NSAIDs, static and dynamic stretching, active assisted range of motion, isometrics and gravity minimized exercises with a focus on gluteus medius strengthening, gait training with an assisted device, and double limb balance exercises. It is vital that you maintain physician weight-bearing precautions during this phase. Patients in the moderate involvement phase can benefit from progressing range of motion and strengthening exercises to active range of motion as tolerated, concentric and eccentric contractions in gravity lessened and against gravity positions, double-limbed closed kinetic chain exercises like mini squats or wall sits, single leg upper extremity support exercises, gait training without assistive device, and stair introduction. During the mild involvement phase, the goal is to eliminate pain completely, continue functional range of motion maintenance, progress isotonic exercises against gravity, improve gait and stair efficiency, and maintain balance improvements with functional exercises. The outlook of leg calve perthes depends on the child's age and the severity of the disease. Children younger than six years old who receive treatment are more likely to end up with a normal hip joint ultimately. Untreated children older than age six are more likely to ultimately end up with a deformed hip joint despite delayed treatment as well as developing arthritis later in life. Because this disease is so rare and only found in children, there are no specific LCP outcome measures with MCID values. Some functional outcome measures used when evaluating these patients include the lower extremity functional scale, the Harris HIP score, and the PEDS quality of life inventory, which is administered monthly. Listed here are several references used for this presentation that contain more information about leg calve perthes.